Spirit of Unity. Amen. It's another time, another wonderful time to come together and praise God. And certainly glad that you're here. The scripture reading tonight comes from Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 12. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the powers of this dark world, and against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. So my question tonight is, do you know your enemies? Do you know who your enemies are? It's an open-ended question. And people will answer it in many different ways. Webster defines enemy as one seeking to injure, overthrow, or confound an opponent. As Christians, it's important to know our enemies in light of knowing how to fight the proper battles, of knowing what battles to fight. First of all, we know that our enemy is the devil. He opposes God, therefore opposes God's people. So we know that, that Satan is our enemy, and we have to understand what that means. Notice how Peter describes him in 1 Peter 5, 8. Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Picture that in your mind. Satan is looking for someone to devour. The devil tempts us. He torments us in order to get us to turn away from God. Now, we understand as Christians, we will at times fall to temptation. Satan's goal is to get us to fall enough times to where we start considering ourselves unworthy. To where we start thinking, man, this just isn't worth it. I can't do it. And he wants us to turn away from God. And even though Jesus defeated Satan on the cross, he still tries to influence people to turn away from God. He still fights those little battles. We know that the war has been won. We know that we have victory in Jesus. We know that. The Bible tells us that. But Satan continues to put those little things out there in front of us, trip us up. And he's hoping we get to the point where we won't get back up, where we stay down, where we won't turn to God, where we won't ask for forgiveness. And then he can claim victory. We have to know that he is the enemy. But we also know that when we accept the gift of grace, he gets angry. Satan doesn't like to lose. And so when we make the decision to accept the gift of grace, when we are obedient to the gospel, it makes him angry. I always tell new Christians, be prepared because Satan is going to come after you with both barrels blazing. I mean, and you can talk to a lot of new Christians, and maybe you can remember when you first became a Christian, it's like that first week is one of the toughest weeks you've ever faced as far as spirituality. Because Satan knows you're young. Satan knows that at that time you're vulnerable. And he wants to attack because he wants to turn you away from God. He wants to keep you from becoming rooted in your faith. He doesn't want you to know God like God wants to know him. Think of it this way. After Jesus was baptized, the Spirit led him out into the wilderness, or out into the desert, where, according to Luke, he was tempted by the devil for 40 days, and he ate nothing. He ate nothing. Now, the first temptation we read about, Satan tells Jesus to turn the rocks into bread. Now, if you hadn't eaten for a while, that's quite a temptation, isn't it? But Jesus wouldn't do it because he knew he cannot give in to Satan, regardless of how innocent it may seem. You know, really, when you look at the temptations of Jesus, 
The only one you can really consider sinful, I mean, really sinful, is when Satan says, bow down and worship me. Turn rocks into bread so that you can nourish your body. That sounds like something innocent. Or even, you know, prove God's power by jumping off this cliff or jumping off this temple and he'll catch you. But see, that's trying God, and that's what Jesus said when he quoted the scripture back to him. And so we understand that whenever Satan lays something out before us, it's not always going to be something ugly and sinful that we can look at right away and say, oh, I'm going to avoid that. That's why we know that, that Satan is slick. You know, if he coming at us with things that we knew were, were wrong all the time, he'd be pretty easy to avoid. try to avert our, our gaze somewhere else and, and not on God. But look at what Luke says in Luke chapter 4 and verse 13. And when the devil had ended every temptation, he departed from him until an opportune time. I mean, think about what that means. He couldn't get Jesus to give him any of the temptations. Even the one for food, when we know he was hungry. And so Satan leaves him, and the Bible says he's going to try to tempt Jesus at a more opportune time. What more opportune time would there be than that? You think about it. As Christians, a lot of times when we're baptized, we're on fire for God, and and we're strong, and yeah, Satan comes at us, and we struggle sometimes, but we're still on fire for God. Maybe a year or two down the road, that fire starts to dim a little bit. The newness wears off, and maybe it's not quite as exciting to us. And Satan sees that, and he sees when we start to get not so much disillusioned with God, but like we talked about this morning, we start stop having that wonder that God wants us to have. And it's more of a commonplace. But Satan wasn't that a sin. And I want you to know, first and foremost, that temptation is not a sign of not being right with God. There's a lot of people that have that theory. So, well, Satan's still tempting you. You can't be right with God. You can't be with God because he wouldn't allow that to happen. Temptation means you're a threat to Satan. He is attempting to get you to fall. Satan has no need to entice those who are already lost. He's already done. <clears throat> what he wants is those who claim God as their father, who claim Jesus Christ as their savior. And so he'll tempt us to get us to fall. He wants to embarrass us. He wants to bring us down. He wants to hold us down. We know that when he tempted Jesus, Jesus quoted scripture back to him. But you remember on the last two temptations, Satan quoted scripture back to Jesus. You know, so we are dealing with an enemy that knows our game plan. He knows where we stand. He knows the things that we know. So to say that when you're tempted, all you need to do is to quote or read scripture, that may be a little bit of oversimplification. I mean, yeah, that's good. That'll give you strength, and it may remind you, but there's probably going to be a little bit more than that involved. Because that temptation is still going to be strong. Satan is strong. And so what we need to do is stand behind Jesus. Look at Jude 9. But even the archangel Michael, now get that, the archangel Michael, when he was disputing with the devil about the body of Moses, did not dare bring a slanderous accusation against him, 
but said, The Lord rebuke you. Even the archangel Michael, one of the most powerful of God's servants, he put it into God's hands. The Lord rebuke you. Because he knew, like we know, that we don't have the power to overcome Satan. Only God does. And God done that through Jesus. And so we need to stand behind our Lord and our Savior in order to have Satan rebuked. But I like the part when it says he did not dare bring a slanderous accusation against them. We know that Satan wants us to fall. We know that he is the enemy. But even the archangel Michael did not judge him. Did not use angry words against him, so to speak. But he called for God to rebuke him. Secondly, our enemy is the world. Now, it's not talking about this physical creation that God made. This means the system, the ways of the world. We look around. And we see the world being involved in things that we wonder why, wonder how. What would they do that for? Many non-Christians see Christianity as a list of, uh, of don'ts when it really is uh, about doing, not not doing. When you feel yourself doing the Lord's work, the world really has a little appeal. When you put your mindset that everybody else's needs are more important than your own, pride starts to go away. And see, when we start getting rid of our pride, Satan starts losing one of his enemies. Or one of his tools, I should say. Starts losing one of his tools. So because you think about it, there are basically three sins in the world. And one of them is the pride of life. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Every sin is going to fall in at least one of those categories, if not all of them. I mean, when we think about Eve in the garden, when, the, when Satan, when the serpent tempted her, all three of those categories were represented. Because Eve looked at the fruit and saw us beautiful look at, lust of the eyes. She saw it was good for food, lust of the flesh. And she saw it was good for making her wise, the pride of life. And so Satan got her right there. And so when we start losing that pride, when we start putting others before ourselves, Satan loses one of those tools that can draw us away. And when we start filling ourselves with the Lord and his word, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eye starts to dwindle as well. So think about it. If you're sitting down to a nice, big, juicy T-bone steak and somebody comes up and says, hey, here's a McDonald's hamburger, you want it? You want to take it? Probably not. Probably not. Why would I want that when I can have this? It's big. It's juicy. It's thick. And that's kind of the way it is. God is offering us the best there is to have, and Satan is trying to offer us a very much inferior replacement. You know, we hear about people selling their soul to the devil in order to get this great success. So we don't want to throw that away for something that's temporary. 
You know, the secret is to be filled with the things of God. Proverbs 27 and verse 7, He who is full loathes honey, but to the hungry, even what is bitter, tastes sweet. So if we don't continue to fill ourselves and we get to that emptiness, we'll take anything to fill us. Anything. I mean, we've may have seen things on TV or, or read things talking about people out you know, being scavengers for food because they have nothing to eat. Anything they can find, they will eat because they're hungry. But if they're full, even that which is good, they don't want. Because they're full. And it's the same way spiritually. If we're empty spiritually, we'll take the first thing that comes along. And we'll, we'll get that in our mind. But if we keep ourselves full, we don't have to worry about that. And as we said, the desires of this world are temporary. Everything in this world is going to be destroyed. The Word tells us that. That's why I get so riled up sometimes about the climate change people. God designed the world to end. It's going to someday. I don't care what you do. I don't care how careful you are with the resources. I don't care how many cars and come out and to eliminate the carbon footprint. God said this world is going to be destroyed. And so we have to understand that God's in control. John wrote in 1 John in chapter 2 and verse 17, The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. Now, and really when you think about that, it doesn't really give the whole truth because every person, every person's eternal soul is going to live forever, so to speak. But usually when the Bible talks about living, it's talking about eternal life. Because eternal condemnation, being in hell with Satan for all of eternity, is no way to live. That's not living. And so when we see that, it, it's not saying that those who are evil are going to die and cease to exist. But they're just going to be in a terrible place. A place they don't really want to be once they get there. You know, you hear people will say, well, I'll see you in hell. You don't know what you're saying, Mike. You don't have a clue. Because it's far worse than what you can even begin to imagine. It also raises the question, are things of the world wrong? It depends. What is your mindset on the things of the world? What position do they hold Activities do you do? Are there ones that, that cause you to stop and wonder, should I be doing this? The rule of thumb that I like to go by is if you have to justify yourself, you're probably wrong. I mean, that's not always true, but usually, if I have to justify to people why I go to a certain place or why I do a certain thing, it's probably better off if I don't. And that eliminates all signs of evil or all signs of doing wrong. You know, God has blessed us with so many things in this world. He has spoiled us here on earth. So much to the point we love living here. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's a blessing from God. But when God calls us home, that should be even more exciting. We should be ready to do that. To go spend eternity with him. That should be so exciting because that's our ultimate goal as Christians. Spend eternity with God. But the things of this world can pull us away. And John wants to remind us that 
it will all pass away. You know, enjoy it while you can, but don't ever let it get in the way of you and your relationship with God. Don't ever make it more valuable than what it really should be. But keep it in its place. Christians must be in contrast to the world, and sometimes that's so difficult. Maybe we like to fit in. We don't want to stand out like a sore thumb. We don't want people to think that we're weird, that we're strange. And so often we get caught up in the ways of the world so that we can become like them. I mean, we don't want to be snobs. We don't want to ignore the world. God sends us into the world. God wants us to be the light of the world, the salt of the earth. So we have to go in amongst the world, amongst the worldly people to live, and to bring his gospel to a lost and dying world. So we don't want to avoid the world in that sense, but the system of the world, the way they live, the things they believe. You know, we are, are called to shine like a diamond in the sunlight. You know, the Christian needs to live a life that displays love and faith. Remember, Jesus said, you are the light of the world. He doesn't say you might be easy as you are. And so we have to take that to heart and understand what that means. That we light up the dark world. We live for God. We display the love of God in all that we do and, all, and to everyone we meet. And if we talk about the way that, that we involve ourselves in the world, sometimes we might need to ask, would I be comfortable inviting Jesus to be with me when I do this? As we said this morning, he's omnipresent, so he's always with us anyway. And so that will help us when we go out into the world and we display that love and display that faith because, hey, we know we're not alone. We know that he's with us. Look at Romans chapter 14, verse 23. He says, But the man who has doubt is condemned if he eats, because he is eating not from faith, and everything that does not come from his faith is sin. And so a lot of times people will do things because someone else convinces them to. You know, Romans 14, in the first part of chapter 15, Paul is discussing this in great detail, how important it is to be convicted in your own mind of your faith. How some people will set aside one day as special, and others don't, but both of them are right. Both of them are fine. You don't have to do that. It's talking about how sometimes the, the stronger brethren look down on the weaker brethren and says, you don't do that. You just bring them along and you love them and you serve them in order to help them grow. He said, everything you do has to come from faith. And of course, in context, he's specifically talking about one who, who's eating and he dealt with that in 1 Corinthians. He was eating meat, sacrificed to idols. And a lot of the Greek Christians, a lot of those Christians in Corinth, they, well, they all came out of paganism. And in their mind, the way they worshipped their pagan god was eating that meat that was sacrificed to them. See, what they didn't use, they would take and they would sell it to the marketplaces. And then people could go buy it. Christians would go buy it and eat it, and there wouldn't be a thing about it. Paul says it doesn't matter because that God's not real. But if you are causing your brother to stumble, that is, you're eating it and causing him to sin, don't eat it. There's nothing wrong with eating it unless you're causing him to sin. And so that's why Paul says here, unless it comes from faith, it's sin. You're going to be convicted in your own mind. So don't doubt. So we have to be in contrast to the world in that 
right sense. And finally, our third enemy is the flesh. Now, we're not talking again about the body. This is the evil tendency of your inward self. The desires of the flesh. You know, there are religious teachings out there that says all matter is evil. All flesh is evil. So therefore, Jesus could not have come to the earth, could not have been a man, because all flesh is evil, and he was not evil. But that's not what we're talking about here. He's talking about the desires. You know, we are new creations when we give our life to Jesus. But that old nature is still going to rear its ugly head every now and again. That's why we're told to crucify the old man. That's why we're told to bury him and be raised to walk a new life. But that old nature, it just won't give up. You know, Paul spent a lot of time writing to the Romans about this very thing in Romans chapter 7, verses 7 through 25. Of how difficult it is. To live the spiritual life without the fleshly side trying to take over. He says, I do the things I don't want to do. I've got it in my mind the right thing to do, the spiritual thing to do, and I set my mind to do that, and I end up doing the things I don't want to do because the fleshly side takes over. You know, Jesus told his disciples in the garden when they were sleeping, the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. In that case, it was. But as we go through this life, the flesh is strong. The spirit is willing, the flesh is strong. It should have that strong hold. And so we have to learn to overcome that and give that all to God. But notice how Paul explained this to the Galatians in Galatians chapter 5 and verse 17. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. To me, that verse is very encouraging because Paul is saying, listen. We know this is how what's going to happen. We know you have a desire to do the right thing, but your flesh is going to try to pull you away. And guess what? Sometimes it's going to win. Sometimes that's going to win. But that doesn't mean we're defeated. Because God promises us, when we make those wrong decisions, that he'll forgive us of our sin. If we go to him. God is for us. You know, it would be great if once we got into the waters of baptism, we were immersed and we come out and we were just immune from all temptation and sin. Wouldn't that be great? We never had to worry about it. That's not how it works. Because God created us to be able to choose and make decisions. And sometimes decision has a strong hand. Of course, the battle is between self-life and Christ's life. Do I do it my way? Or do I do it Jesus' way? Do I want to be full of self? Do I want to be full of him? And it's a decision we make. It's a decision we make when we decide to give our life to Jesus when we're baptized. But it's also a decision we need to make day after day. Because Satan doesn't leave us alone once we make that decision. He comes after us all over. He comes after us strong. And as, as you all know, I'm a big college football fan, follow recruiting. And once a kid comes out and says, okay, I'm going to commit to such and such university, those other schools that are recruiting him, they don't give up. They recruit him harder. Even though he says, I'm committed to this school, they recruit him harder because they know until there's a, a signature on the dotted line, he can change his mind. And Satan knows until we are called home and we reach eternity with God, there's a chance that we will fall. 
And so he comes at us hard to try to get us to come down. He tries to focus us inward. So we're talking about self-life instead of Christ's life. The lust of the flesh keeps popping up. And through Jesus, we can overcome it. Because he's defeated sin. We do this by faith. Look at Romans chapter 6 and verse 11. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. You know, Paul started out in this chapter talking about how grace abounds where there's sin. And he heads off the question, well, does that mean that, that we should sin more so we can get more grace? And Paul said, no. He said, the point is, if something is dead, how can you live in it any longer? So if you're telling yourself you're dying to sin, then sin needs to be gone. You know, because we know death is just a separation of body and spirit. And once death happens, our spirit does not inhabit the dead body any longer. It says you can't live it any longer because it's dead. And he said that's the way your spiritual life needs to be. You need to consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. Live in that new life. Walk in that new life. Keep moving forward with your light shining. That we kind of touched on earlier, not all desires of the flesh are sinful. I mean, God has given us this body of flesh, and we do have a responsibility to take care of it. The flesh needs food and water. So it's not wrong to desire food and water. The problem is that the flesh can get carried away and the pleasures of the flesh can lead to sin. We all can admit it. Sin is fun. Sin is pleasurable. If it wasn't, we wouldn't be tempted by it. Now afterwards, when we realize what we've done is not fun, when the Spirit convicts us, we think, what have I done? Why did I do that? But at the time, when that temptation comes, this is going to bring me pleasure. And even in Hebrews, when it talks about Moses choosing to be identified as a Hebrew instead of the grandson of Pharaoh, he says, choosing to suffer with his people rather than live a season in the pleasure of sin. He chose to be a Hebrew, even though he was raised as an Egyptian. And so we have to make that choice. We have to make that choice knowing that, that we've given our life to God, and we need to live in that, and we need to be strong when those temptations come. And we've got to learn self-control. Paul said in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and verse 27, that I discipline my body and keep it under control, lest after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Now I think, wow, if Paul could be worried about losing grace and losing his salvation, what does that say for me? Because I really better be watching what I do, what I say, how I act. Because we see that the small window of Paul's life, and we see how faithful he was, we see how spiritual he was. And yeah, we do see a few downfalls of Paul. I mean, he talks about the things he'd done before he was a Christian. But even when he had the, the disagreement with Silas, or with Barnabas, before he took off with Silas. You know, the Bible tells us they had a disagreement, but the Greek word indicates that it was such a sharp disagreement, it might have come to blows. It was a terrible, terrible argument. And some people say that might have been the, the thorn in the flesh that he was talking about with his bad temper. That he had a bad temper. We don't know what it is. It doesn't explain it. But everybody can come up with something. But you think about how the desires of the flesh can pull us away from that which is spiritual. He said, so discipline your body. Keep it under control. So you don't. You don't lose your salvation just because you couldn't control your body. 
The secret to winning any battle is knowing the enemy. And that's important. We've got to know who we're fighting against. And in order to be victorious, we've got to have the proper battle plan. And God gives that to us. God gives that to us. He identifies who the enemy is. He gives us our marching orders. And we go out and live it. We must also concede that we can't defeat our enemies on our own. We're powerless to defeat Satan on our own. We're powerful to have self-control on our own. We're powerless. So we have to give it to God. The only victory we have comes through Jesus Christ. And as long as we do these things and we defeat our enemy and we fight them with God, then we're going to get the ultimate victory, eternal life in heaven. And that's what we're seeking. That's what we're seeking. I hope the lesson tonight has helped you learn how to identify your enemies and help you learn how to overcome those enemies. If not, go to God, ask for strength. Go to God, ask for more wisdom. And he will give that to you. If you need to respond, So that we can lift you up to God. Think about that as we stand.